I'm Grace. I came up with the title for this talk, Ask Me Anything, because at the moment, um, one of the things I've been really into is when people pass quizzes round on Facebook. Um, and I'll talk about one of those in a little while. And also, because some, like a few people with autism, questions have been a bit of a difficulty in my life because um, there's a combination of really liking questions and wanting to ask people lots and lots and finding out all sorts of things that might seem absurd or inappropriate about some and also finding it difficult when people ask me questions such as um, it took me a really long time, a lot of years to understand why some questions might make some people feel cornered and then when I eventually asked that and um, people were asking me the same questions um, it would trigger panic, confusion. Um, but I'll come back to that one in a bit. I was reading a couple of really interest, interesting articles online about double standards that people with autism have to live with. But I'll start by talking a bit about my background um, and how I got to where I am today. Um, I was undiagnosed as a child um, and I have autism. Um, Canna's autism, which in general is less hidden than Asperger's in childhood, but there's also a lot of myths about Asperger's um, and I think in some ways they have a lot more difficult time because, because of these myths that label it as mild or slight autism or even not really autism, an offshoot of it and all these things. Um, are quite damaging and disabling because that prevents not only from gaining self-insight but all the essential support people may need um, for this severe developmental, neurological and sensory condition. Um, because descriptions like mild um, trivialise the reality of living with it and it can be really difficult um, to find the right sort of words which really give the right message and don't mislead people such as I'm classed as having high functioning autism but does that mean that I'm high functioning as a whole person? Um, anyone that has a lot of understanding about autism will know that that's not really the case. It means that I have a normal IQ um, or in some cases it can be above normal and it, it means there may be areas in my life that I'm particularly good at, m maybe more than average people, but there's also areas in my life where I don't function well at all and these areas I need a lot of support for. Um, and being undiagnosed meant that all the um, difficulties I had um, such as I was seen as a hyperactive, maladjusted child. You see, the, the social workers and psychologists involved at the time, I was living in Doncaster, and even though I had obvious classical autism, they completely refused to acknowledge it. They, they said that my mum were over-anxious, a label would be damaging, Whereas they were quite happy to label me and the other children who obviously had some sort of neurological difficulty that were not just behavioural as malads. That's a derogatory term for maladjusted children. Now I'll talk a bit about um, some of the differences that may be between um, autism and somebody that might have a confidence issue because when people are being kind and helpful often they see it as lack of confidence when it's, it, it's really a social disability in many ways. 
um, such as this quiz I came across online that somebody passed around on BuzzFeed is called how introverted are you and when I looked through them a lot of the things um, may apply to someone with autism but for different reasons to someone who may be just shy such as do you have to take breaks to recharge um, for people with autism the brain structure and the nervous system is different to that of a ne neurotypical. Um, so social interaction takes a lot more hard work. Um, normal living takes much more hard work. Even for me, things like walking around town, even though in many ways I'm better than average people at such as maps and bus timetables, it's a real difficulty. Um, getting through crowds, knowing which way to step, knowing how much physical space there is between me and other people. So often I have to take big detours round people or stand frozen until people move out of my way. And sometimes people may tut and misjudge me for this. But even though I have a lot of insight into it, it's not something I can prevent happening. And also things, on this quiz like do you mentally prepare before you have phone calls um, autism is a communication disorder um, finding words is sometimes impossible especially in cases of stress um, such as if something's well prepared such as giving this talk um, I have everything well prepared but um, for a thing that might seem simple and just thinking off the top of your head and gauging what the other person might say on the other end of the phone and working out how, how to respond to it, it's purely neurological and imagination difficulties. Um, there is quite a few myths and facts about people with autism, such as, um, I may come to them later, but such as, the difficulty with imagination is often misunderstood because the old fashion literature may say they lack imagination and that's a misleading way of saying it because um, and a lot of people will just say well that's rubbish because a lot of people with autism are very clever at creating things, ideas, drawing, writing making songs, singing, but the imagination is such as for consequences, um, what's going to happen, what may happen in a difficult situation, what the outcomes may be, um, or imagining what to do when something goes wrong. And in life there's many things um, going wrong all the time. And also on this um, this quiz, such as, is a communal table at a coffee shop not even an option? Well, for someone with autism, um, how would you know whether it's appropriate to ask someone to share a table or whether it's a complete social blunder? It's a developmental condition. So often the social development is at a much younger age and also, um, there's a lot of physical difficulties. I, I find it in coffee shops, physically getting in and out of a table because I have spatial awareness difficulties. Um, I can easily bang into coffee tables and knock everything over, but I've had a lot of insight into this for a really long time. So you may see me in a coffee shop doing things really slowly and carefully to get in and out of the table like an older person might. So a lot of the um, body language and actions that an autistic person may do is misleading to some and often um, people take it to be lack of confidence. Now, one of my special interests is play and accessing play equipment for adults that need it most. 
Um, because such as for me, um, as a teenager, I had no concept of how other teenagers think and feel. I know now, I read a lot of books aimed at um, teenagers, children. It's the only books I'm really interested in. Um, and such as there's one book I, I was reading, I, I can't remember the titles of, of them off the top of my head, but it, it's a group of mainstream girls who are in a football team. And it describes how, um, how one of the girls, it's from her point of view, can imagine where the other team players will be and kick the ball in the right direction accordingly. Um, an autistic person, at least I, I know about myself at that age, and even the way I am now, I'd have completely no concept of that. So obviously, being undiagnosed as well, team games were one of the things um, I got into a lot of trouble for at school. Um, you see, as a result of um, being undiagnosed, I suffered a lot of social exclu exclusion and isolation in the neighbourhood. Um, I went to six different schools, some of them special schools, which a lot of the focus was on behaviour. Um, and the thing is, teaching an, an autistic person um, social skills. I was reading a, um, an article on, on Facebook recently that um, my friend Dale Smith put on about and said, um, I've got a quote somewhere, um, but basically the article is saying and what she said is why social skills training is damaging and can damage self-esteem. And what I, I've learnt myself as well. Um, oh, and also, um, she said, it can make people less tolerant of others, such as us, others with autism. Um, I mean, I, I prefer to think of um, any social skills must be developed naturally not trained or learnt because um, that can be very damaging to who the person naturally is and go totally against the developmental age. Such as um, one of the articles, um, I haven't managed to get a copy of the other article that was, um, see if I, if I can find the name, social skills or stereotypes, what my autism classes didn't teach me. Um, a lot of the social skills that this girl was taught, although there were certain things um, she got something out of as a small child, and some of the things prevented bullying, um, there was a lot that um, the classes missed out and didn't and discriminated against, um, such as this girl was gay and the social skills classes just took the so just taught the social norm of being hetero like that was a, an assumption and nothing else was considered and i think the one thing i notice when i see programs such as about dating for people with various impairments and people with autism is the developmental side is never taken into account. The fact that um, that person may be in, at a much younger age to their peers, such as for me, um, after my diagnosis, one of the um, greatest things was to realise I didn't have to um, have any pressure to live up to the adult that I couldn't really be and have all these social expectations put on me that were causing me a lot of anxiety and depression. Um, one of my main issues was um, if I saw an inaccessible bouncy castle, it caused me a lot of feelings of pain, loss, rather like homesickness, because um, that was the sort of thing I was interested in, bouncy castles, play. I had no concept of um, 
fashion and, and the other things the other teenagers were talking about. Um, and what really helped me was um, eventually I, I found a place with a bouncy castle for adults with learning difficulties. Um, it was quite a battle getting some staff to understand um, why their ideas about age appropriate um, was wrong and damaging for some people. Um, but I found through play, I've developed a lot in my own way, at my own pace. And now I naturally want to try some other things. Um, and also there's a lot of things about play that develops coordination, um, such as I had a friend that used to come to these places with me. And we also had a trampolining session. Um, and he learnt to ride a bike when he was 26. And a lot of the repetitive bouncing and some of the exercises for such as dyspraxia we were taught in those groups were a massive benefit. Um, and this seems to be a thing that's been massively overlooked. Um, but it, it is becoming known now that play can benefit all adults but I find from my point of view um, I find it difficult to find other adults that really want to engage in play um, even though a lot say they feel like I do um, the world wouldn't be the way it is if that were really the case nobody would have any children because they wouldn't be able to stand looking at a bouncy castle that they couldn't go on now, I think um, I think it might be a good time. It's um, nearly time to have a break. But uh, has anyone got any questions at, at this stage? Hi. Um, you said the practice exercises were a massive benefit. How did they benefit you? What helped? What did they have to do? Well, I think um, the help with balance, maybe. Some of the exercises we were taught, such as either on the trampoline or in an aerobics group, was just simple crossing over. And I think it helps with a lot of things, including, I find with me, um, it f improved my map reading skills because it helped me imagine turning a map the other way round. Um, and for other people, it helps with the balance and enable them to have a fulfi more fulfilling life, such as um, learning to ride a bike when, as adults. Um, I mean, I, I always say um, to aim for a fulfilling life rather than a normal life, because such as um, on the programmes I was talking about, um, there seems to be a, a lot of focus on... Um, wanting a normal life, wanting to be like others. But I found um, chasing a normal life um, just causes a lot of anxiety and depression, loss of self-esteem, um, because it may not be the, it's not the right thing for many people who's, who function differently. And I think the best thing to aim for is a fulfilling life, gaining self-insight and finding out why you may not be able to function like other people and, and what works well for an individual. Such as going back to the social skills training. I mean, when I was at school, um, a lot of social skills, age-appropriate social skills, um, were forced onto me that I weren't equipped to cope with at all. And such as things like making conversation at the table. Um, and after I left school and I went to college, um, I'd had that ingrained into me that I must make conversation or else I felt that bad things would happen. Um, I knew I wasn't at school anymore, so I I couldn't be punished exactly, 
but I thought I'd be disliked and ostracised, so I'd struggle to join in conversations in every context possible, and then it would just be counterproductive. I'd say things out of context, people would see me as rude, and I was reading, um, I do help people find the right support and help professionals understand them better. And during one of the, my time with one of the people, um, I was reading some stuff that they'd written for, um, you know, to help a professional understand more about them. And, and there were things like, there's difficulty with turn taking in communication. And some people might think that it's the autistic person that just doesn't understand the manners, doesn't know when the turn is. But it's not really like that. It's physically sensing where the gaps are, physically um, processing where the nuances are. Um, the same sort of thing as crossing roads it's, and getting through crowds in town. It's physically um, a sensory difficulty knowing how far away the traffic is. And it's the same in communication. So it takes ever such a lot more hard work. Um, and also they'd said um, that they need longer to process and interpret questions, especially ambiguous or open-ended ones, and emotionally distressing topics were a problem, and had problems saying certain words. And people often come across as antisocial, and people that see them may think, well, why can't someone just teach them social skills, teach them what to ask people? But when somebody's in that state of anxiety all the time, like um, some of these people that are still um, in the stage I, I was at before I was 23, which is a, a late diagnosis as it is, but um, these are people in the late 20s, 30s, um, even much older, 40s, 50s, that have completely um, lost all quality of life through no diagnosis. I mean, after my diagnosis, my life changed really radically. Um, such as, I remember this incident at, at college where um, I was at a table, I knew I must join in conversation or else, and nobody was giving me any gaps or eye contact. And I remember um, walking out, being tearful, and having palpitations like a panic attack because it put me into a state of conflict. And that was then for me. But some people um, are in that state all the time and are affected even worse than me. Like, um, so obviously trying to teach somebody in that state social skills um, is cruel and would cause a lot of pressure and self self-blame such as some um, if they're clever very clever in one year in, in one area and such as has been to university um often there's an expectation of them to function well in every area um but often um the condition can be completely disabling in other areas especially if the stress of life has um made the brain chemistry really out of balance. Um, I'll come back to talking about that in a bit because um, for me, I was always naturally an outgoing person and I've had a few years on antidepressants, but some people quite understandably um, are scared to go on them because um, because a lot of professionals um, haven't managed to communicate how they work um, and the people may think they'll just paper over the cracks and not solve the underlying problem. But I'll try and talk about my experience with 
antidepressants in in a little while but i think maybe it's a good time to have a five minute break so we can ho all have a bit of a a breather and then i'll try and come back to some of these things now i'll try and start back where i left off which is about my experience with antidepressants i mean normally um I would have said in the past, well, no, they just <coughs> don't solve the underlying problem at all, which um, is right in a lot of ways. It's important to address the underlying issues. Um, what happens with me after my diagnosis? Um, although I, I had a, a lot of freedom, I, I attended groups for people with learning disabilities, as I've said before, where I could develop in my own way at my own pace um, but I, I had a lot of anxiety and depression which I didn't realize um, that I had in a way because I knew I had problems caused from my background at the wrong schools and then we had ongoing problems with housing such as noisy abusive neighbors which I'm doing some work around at the moment i've been writing an article for my idea about no impact housing which is housing for people that want a peaceful environment and are able to think how their actions may impact on others outside their own flat and i noticed I was giving a talk to a, a small number of people at the council about this and I did mention my other special interests too and I noticed how all my special interests actually connect with each other. I noticed during that talk such as I do have a special interest in massage and tactile therapies and I run my own women's group for this and one of the things <coughs> that people learn in massage is to remember to make the movement slow rather than quick and I have got a little prop for this I, I wasn't sure whether I was going to use it or not because it, it does take a bit of assembling so I think what I might do is leave it till the end and then um, when we go for coffee um, we can have a look then because it's got a written description with it but it's a similar principle to um, what I've been doing such as with someone's support workers. There was in a, a habit of just constantly letting the cupboard doors slam, which um, in little non-insulated flats, that does have an impact on the neighbours. And that's something I've written about in, in my No Impact article. Um, and I think the thing that I have to do because I have dyspraxic jerky movements I always have to make conscious efforts to make sure my movements are slow and careful such as I can come in um, if I manage to go out somewhere at night to a party or something have a drink I can manage to come in and not even disturb my mum so I'm sure a lot of neurotypicals would be able to learn how to do that and I'm hoping to do some training with housing and housing associations, councils um, because of the background I've had with really badly abusive noisy neighbours. It's something I really appreciate having now and the last thing I want to do is I want to be able to go out and enjoy myself and then I come in silently like a cat because I appreciate the neighbours we have and that's how I want to be treated but I notice there's always a stereotyping like if a person with autism tries to explain to a housing association they've got a noise problem they automatically think that it's the autism that's sensitive to noise and not the fact that there's a real problem because there's a lot of programs on at the moment that are quite good documentaries and explain some of the dire problems that people go through with noise problems so i think if um 
there was a no impact housing block, like people being segregated on lifestyle rather than age. It used to be done on age, which can work well to an extent, like older people are more likely to want a quite mature lifestyle, but it's not set in stone. Um, but if it was done purely on lifestyle, it would probably be um, a few older people and a small younger of young ones that are like me, um, such as we have one other young person in our block that's very good at thinking outside the block and chooses to take off her high heels when she comes up the stairs if she comes in. Um, So about um, going back to the article, the double standard we have to live with every day. Um, I mean, it's easy enough to find on Facebook because um, my name's Grace Parry. It's easy enough to find me. I've got um, everything I have on Facebook is completely open um, if I've done the settings right. So the, the two articles are somewhere near the top of my wall anyway. But... Um, what this article says, um, continually noticing behaviour that people get away with, that autistic people are taught, often extremely firmly, not to do. The main example is in a club, in a club environment, is unwanted physical touch. And these things, um, seeing people break these rules that autistic people have got into a lot of trouble for, um, is really confusing such as um from my point of view i particularly like and crave the kind of physical tactile contact that is often reserved for young children and i think when i founded my group which is trust and freedom and girly time is the name of the women's group i, I run because um that's what the majority felt safe and comfortable with to have an all women environment but trust and freedom itself is some um, an idea I've got which is something that's lacking in society um, you see if you go to a mainstream club everything's highly sexualized um, like a cuddle wouldn't mean a simple cuddle it would mean um, that you probably want to go home and, and like go out with this person have a one night stand with this person but i think there needs to be um something in society um where just tactile contact is acceptable in the same innocent way that it's acceptable for young children not just for people with autism because um i think i came to this idea through um, talking to people in the autism group and finding out because I thought that that would be a safe environment for me to find these kind of friendships um, but I find that a lot of them are actually quite averse to physical touch some find it an irritation um, and that's how I come to my idea about found, finding something to try and find like-minded people that feel like I do, which is quite difficult. I mean, I have found some, um, but I think one of my original ideas was to set up something that's for asexual people, um, because that's something that is quite new on the scene and not really understood. Um, there's a lot of clubs sort of for gay people by um, support for transgender but asexual is rarely mentioned and I think it's something that needs to be brought out in the open a lot more. I mean I have looked online and found some sites but they either crash, cost money or in their, in, their in countries millions of miles away which I don't want. I think I want um, something local where you can have coffee talk to people but um but i think what i've done with trust and freedom it, it's not strictly about asexuals because 
some people may not really know what they are. I mean, I, I class as myself as likely to be asexual rather than um, it being set in stone because um, I feel it's less likely for me to fall for someone and have an adult relationship. But I know I definitely um, enjoy being with people that, that like tactile contact, that enjoy massage, all the things that um, people, young children may take for granted or, or people in families or relationships may enjoy are not really accessible in general society. So I think um, my ideal would to be sort of build a community that is and have, um, have clubs or, or social events where, um, where that sort of contact is accepted as the norm without it being misread and people expecting more. I think I, I see a lot of things in life as how they should be um, because it's just no good putting up with them as how they are, such, such as the design of a lot of things, such as going back to my housing. Um, I did go on a trip with people with various disabilities to look at some newly designed houses and what we talked about was the fact that we should have been involved in the design and planning because I found with um, a lot of the designs and things, they're just not thought out properly at all. And one of my main bugbears is clothing. There's a lot of discrimination in clothing against women, against people with various impairments, including autism, um, and against people that are healthy, that, um, such as me, I'm a lot smaller than average. Um, and everything's, there's a lot of things where only big people are catered for. I find everything I try on, um, it's massive on me. And also I find a lot of clothing is, is very disabling, such as I'd love to be able to wear more fashionable things, um, more stylish things. Um, but there's absolutely nothing for me that doesn't hurt, scratch, has impossible buttons, impossible things to take on and off. Um, and when life in general is some, um, such as getting ready in the morning, is, takes a lot more time, effort and energy than for most people, such as even finding an object in my room. Um, I can look and look and it might be in a place that's obvious to most people, but for me, I just won't be able to physically see it at all. And I think what's helped me these days is that social services have now recognised autism as a disability. But that's not the experience a lot of people have with them. Like if, I mean, at the moment I'm quite lucky because I've got a lot of good insights and and my mum, who also has Asperger's, she was newly diagnosed in her 60s, helps me communicate with them and has insight into me, which I haven't even got myself. Now, I'll go back to what I was saying about my experience on antidepressants because I'm digressing a bit. So eventually, after we'd had a really bad time in a particular property, and. My first antidepressant I tried was mirtazapine, which contains a sedative. Um, a psychiatrist persuaded me um, in quite a good, well-communicated way to give it a try and I explained about how you go into a downward spiral and um, don't pick up again. So I did try it, but then um, we got a call from the housing officer to say that there was another property for us. So I thought, well, this thing's making me feel, in, feel like a zombie. I don't think I really need it. But eventually, I, I didn't really um, pick up. We still had a lot of stresses going on. So um, eventually, there was some other issues that I still struggle with sometimes, such as I have trichotillomania. Um, 
so I talked to my doctor and we tried a pill called Citalopram and within two days I had a really brilliant result. Um, at first I had a few side effects such as tiredness, yawning, headache, blurred vision but nothing really severe but then within two days my movements became smoother, less jerky. I wasn't constantly banging my hands into things. Um, I wasn't constantly getting upset. I felt really calm and, and, and at peace for once. And I started sleeping better. And then by the fourth day, um, I felt really get up and go and ready to um, take on challenges. And a lot of new things started opening up in my life since then. It, it was quite gradual. I mean, I was dealing with an issue uh, in direct discrimination issue with an adventure park at the time, which um, that were part of the start of my journey into advocacy um, because I, I got involved with speaking up for advocacy for a while, um, but they're no longer running in the way they were. Um, but that led me on to trying all sorts of different things and also um, with my experience with the other people with autism, um, I eventually came to start in Trust and Freedom, um, like, like I talked about. And I've also been involved with um, an advocacy organisation called Barriers to Bridges, which another lady who's visually impaired set up. And it, it's been interesting with both um, work hard to learn about each other's backgrounds because her background's so different and opposite to mine. Like often, I've often been forced into doing things um, and pressured into doing things which I've, I've not been equipped to cope with. Whereas her and some of her other colleagues have been constantly not allowed to do anything because of their impairment. And I'm also, in, on a course called Just the Job, which is about finding suitable employment for people with various disabilities. Um, for me, I have had various jobs in the past, which in some ways I weren't really equipped to cope with, but um, somehow I managed to muddle through without things going badly wrong. But um, but they were part-time um, and temporary. Some were quite long, one were quite long lasting, but it, it was part-time and a, a safe niche for me at that time. Um, but looking back, there were a lot of difficulties that just weren't seen or brought into the open. Um, but I think now it'd be about looking at um, something like part-time or supply work because or doing the things I do now but get, getting paid for it like I'd be interested in giving talks um, and often the advocacy stuff I do now um, is a bit like a supply work type thing like sometimes I'll get a phone call for, from someone that desperately needs something at short notice so if I'm okay at that particular time if it doesn't affect the routine I have, then, then I'm up for that. And that's better for me than if it was a lot of hours. I think it impacts a lot on my own life. Um, sort of functioning, looking after myself. Buying clothes is, is a, a massive challenge because everything, like I said, has to be sewed and altered. I can't just go and buy something normally and wear it. Um, and I would really like some sort of say, some sort of job in, in the design of things, the fashion industry, um, where I can design things that are practical and comfortable for everyone, like all women, but, um, but look good at the same time, because that's something that's really lacking. Thanks.